Hey, what's going on everybody? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be taking a look at a brand new mini PC from Menace Forum known as the Elite Mini TH50. So I've been really excited to get my hands on this little mini PC because of the CPU it's using. Now in the past we've tested a lot of the Tiger Lake mini PCs with the 28 watt parts like the 1135G7, the 1165G7. But the TH50 is actually using a Tiger Lake H part, and it does offer a higher base TDP, and in these mini PCs it really does make a difference on the graphics side and the CPU side of things. This also supports Thunderbolt 4, so we can connect Thunderbolt peripherals to it, like one of my favorites being a Thunderbolt eGPU, and we will test that by the end of the video. But as you can see, we've still got a very small form factor PC here. Inside of the box, you're going to receive a 65 watt USB type C power adapter. We've also got a hard drive bracket and some hard drive adapters because this will support two 2.5 inch drives inside plus a single M.2 SSD. When it comes to I.O. up front here, we have our audio in, audio out, two full size USB 3.0 ports and our Thunderbolt 4 port. This is a full Thunderbolt 4 port. It does support display out and like I mentioned, we can add an eGPU. Taking a look at each side here, there's not much going on, but we do have plenty of ventilation for their new cooler system they're using in this, and we will take a look at that. Around back, we get two USB 2.0 ports, two more USB 3.2 ports, gigabit ethernet, 2.5 gigabit ethernet, a full-size display port, full-size HDMI, and we have our USB Type-C power port back here, which only functions for power. So when it comes to the specs of the Elite Mini TH50, for the CPU we have the i5-11320H. Four cores, eight threads, we got a base clock of 3.2 gigahertz and a turbo up to 4.4. When it comes to RAM, we do have 16 gigabytes of LPDDR4, but it is soldered down to the board. When it comes to storage, you can get this without an SSD, or you can opt for a 256 or a 512 from the factory, but you could always install something much larger by picking the one up without an SSD from the factory. We have built-in Intel Iris Xe graphics at 1.35 GHz, and this is the 96 execution unit version, so it's the higher performance one over something in the 1135G7. It does come pre-installed with Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.2, and this happened to have Windows 10 on it, but you could always upgrade to Windows 11 if you feel the need. Getting into the mini PC is as simple as removing four screws from the bottom. You can install two 2.5 inch drives. We can easily get to that M.2 SSD and the Wi-Fi slash Bluetooth card. I went ahead and pulled the motherboard out because I just wanted to take a quick look at this cooler and this is definitely sufficient for the chip we're using in here. I do like this new design. We've seen it in a previous mini PC from Menace Forum. And with that one, it was using eight cores and 16 threads. I'm pretty sure we've got enough metal here to keep this i5 nice and chilly. All right, so here we are, fully updated, got a lot of stuff to test out. As you can see, we have that i5-11320H at 3.2 gigahertz, four cores, eight threads, 16 gigabytes of DDR4 at 3200, and the built-in Iris Xe graphics. Keep in mind, this has 96 execution units. Uh, the very first thing I tested was the TDP on the CPU, maximum 64, but it is around 45 when gaming, which is perfectly fine for the cooling system they have in here. And with that higher TDP, it can keep those higher clocks on the CPU and the GPU side of things. So overall, I've had a really good experience with this. Super snappy, web browsing, 4K video playback. We got plenty of power in here, but you know, really when it comes down to these mini PCs, personally, I like gaming and emulation. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at. But the first thing I did with this was run a couple benchmarks. Geekbench 5, looking great on the single core with a 1433, multi 5725. Four cores, eight threads, I was kind of expecting in the mid 5000s. Taking a look at 3D Mark Night Raid, total score here, 18,030. Fire Strike, 4,573. And finally, we have Time Spy with a 1,817. Not bad for integrated graphics, but you know, with the 1165G7 at a higher TDP in the nooks and the smaller PCs I test, we've been able to score around the same amount here. So we need to get into some real world gaming to see how this thing's gonna perform. First up, we have Forza Horizon 5, 900p low. We're getting an average of 65 FPS out of this one. It's actually doing a pretty decent job for 900p on these integrated graphics. Now, if you did want to run this at 1080 high, you can run this at 30 FPS, and in the settings, we can lock it there. But personally, I do like playing at 60, and with something like this, I would always lock that V-Sync on when I'm playing normally. 
Moving over to MK11, 900p with a medium low mix. We're running at 60. Every once in a while when there's lots of particles on screen, I have seen it dip down to 59 using Afterburner up in the top left hand corner. But overall, we're getting really great performance out of this little mini PC. Next on the list, we have Genshin Impact 1080p Medium, and to tell you the truth, I would probably drop some of these down below. I did turn Bloom off, but as you can see, when there's lots of particles on screen, you will get some dips here and there. Doom Eternal is one of those games that really gives these integrated graphics a run for its money, and dynamic resolution scale is really where it's at. I've got it set to 72 FPS, dynamic resolution scale on, 900p low, and it can keep over 60. GTA 5 did much better than I thought it would, and in the past on these Intel Iris XE graphics, I've always had a hard time running this game. It always performed much better on Radeon, but looking at what kind of wattage this thing puts out and we can keep those clocks up high, on this 11320H, this is actually some of the best performance that I've seen out of integrated graphics. Now it's time to take a look at some emulation, and going into this I had a good feeling we'd have really good luck with this given those higher clocks for a mobile CPU. This is pulling around 20 watts at 1440p, PS2 using PCSX2 with the DirectX 11 back end isn't going to be an issue for this little PC. I also wanted to test some original Xbox, and unfortunately I do have to mute it right about now because of the music in the background. But at 720p, CXBX Reloaded does perform quite well with this little system. Wii U is another one I always like to test, so here we are with SimU, Vulcan back in, Smash upscaled to 1080p, running at 60. Looking great, but you know when you go over to something like Breath of the Wild, this might struggle at 60, but I'd say 720p, maybe even 1080p 30 would be possible on this system. And finally, for the emulation section, we have some PS3 using RPCS3, Vulcan back in, 720p. Most of the stuff that I tested actually performed really well. I was having some weird issues with Skate 3, and that's usually my go-to. It was running at 60, but it didn't feel like it was running at 60. Afterburner was telling me it was running great, but the game felt really slow, so I do need to look into that. So, since we do have Thunderbolt built into this little PC, I figured we'd test out a Thunderbolt eGPU. I've got a Sonnet eGPU dock here with a 3080 Ti. The dock itself is only Thunderbolt 3, but it is supported over 4. So we've got the HDMI coming out of the GPU in the Thunderbolt dock. It's going to swap over the input real quick for us. And now, let me go ahead and open up Task Manager. As you can see, we still have that i5-11320H CPU. We can still access the Intel Iris Xe graphics, but what's really gonna make a difference here is that 3080 Ti. Now, it's only connected over Thunderbolt, so it will lack in performance. If you were to plug this into a PCIe X16 slot, we would get much better performance out of the GPU. But with this setup here, it still does an amazing job with AAA games. Here we have Forza Horizon 5, once again, but we're using that 3080 Ti. Ultra settings, 1080p, we're getting an average of around 103 FPS out of this. Now, like I mentioned, this 3080 Ti would do a much better job if it was plugged into, let's say, a real desktop PC with a much powerful CPU and PCIe X16. But we were still able to really up the GPU performance on this mini PC. 
Another thing I always like to look at with these mini PCs is CPU temps, and the cooler they're using here is definitely doing a great job. At idle, we're around 32, average gaming through everything that I tested, 58 degrees Celsius, and the maximum that I could get this to hit while running Cinebench R23 for 10 minutes straight was 82 degrees Celsius. And while testing these mini PCs, I always plug it into a kilowatt meter just so we can get total system power consumption from the wall. At idle, we average around 12 watts. Average gaming, only 31. I thought we'd have a little more there. And the maximum that I could get it to pull from the wall while maxing out all four cores, eight threads, and the built-in GPU was 68 watts. So when it comes down to it, this is a relatively low power PC also. So yeah, the Elite Mini TH50 definitely performs really well for being a mobile chip and having integrated graphics, but you know, adding an eGPU is definitely the way to go on something like this if you want a game. Now using this as your everyday desktop for 4K video playback, browsing the web, email checking, you can do some video editing on this and some photo editing, it would work out just fine. Got a nice small form factor footprint here, and it doesn't pull that much wattage unless you're really pushing that GPU and CPU at the same time, like we saw with the charts. So in the end, if you're looking for a good mini PC that you can later on upgrade with an eGPU, then this is something that I could recommend. They also offer a very similar unit powered by a Ryzen APU. With that, we've got 8 cores and 16 threads, I did a video on it, and CPU performance, at least multi-core performance, is much better on that unit but it doesn't offer Thunderbolt support. So in the end, I mean, it's really up to you. You kind of got to weigh your options there. But that's going to wrap it up for this one. I really appreciate you watching. And if there's anything else you want to see running on the TH50, just let me know in the comments below. If you're interested in learning more, maybe picking one up. Got a few links in the description. And like always, thanks for watching.